Hello, everybody. I have the pleasure to uh, announce to you the, the speaker of the first uh, session of the streaming track. The speakers are uh, Lars Albertson and Christopher Burke. And the talk will be about the lean principles of data ops, which um, will cover the topic of how manufacturing transformations can be applied to data operations. And then I would like to hand over to uh, Lars Albertson, who is uh, the founder of uh, Skling. Uh, they are providing a data uh, value extraction as a service, and Christopher Borg, uh, who will uh, give the second part of the presentation. Thank you very much. Looking forward to it. Thank you, and hi, everyone. I'm sorry not to be able to be there in Berlin in person. It's a wonderful conference, and I definitely miss the atmosphere. Um, I am running a, a small startup called Skling, and we provide data processing as a service, essentially. We build and run data pipelines and, uh, and host data pipelines for our customers as well. And what we essentially sell is operational efficiency and that is that is a deep passion of mine and that's why i'm here trying to share my knowledge uh in in the area and uh, unless i'm mistaken our uh, the, a business model of spling overlaps to some degree with the data kitchen which uh, chris is running uh but he has they are running it they have a much more mature and established startup based in boston i'm based in stockholm is that a fair description, Chris? Sure, that's, that sounds good. Yeah, and I think we both identify that um, there's a lot of pain and problems in data and analytics and that there is some things that you would think are not technological, but uh, that really apply in these principles from, from lean or agile or DevOps or manufacturing really can make an impact on your day-to-day -day life. And I think that's what, uh, what Lars is gonna start to talk to you about and I'll bring it home. And uh, as you notice, we're trying to do this more as a dynamic discussion rather than me speaking into a screen for 40 minutes. Uh, so we'll do a bit of back and forth. Uh, and this is the first time I try this uh, mode of uh, presenting at a conference. So we'll see how it works. Uh, I started my computing career at IBM here in, in Stockholm. Uh, and uh, this was mid '90s. I was my, a teenager. I was running Windows at home, and uh, when when you work with Windows computers at the time, you had this pile of floppy disks. And you install them, you install the software, and you you sort of cuddle it as your pet. If something went wrong, you had to go there and fix it, and so forth. Uh, at IBM, I got to work with OS2 Warp, uh, which I probably none of you remember by now. There was a significant difference, however, in the way that we installed and managed the machines and the applications installed on them. Because when we installed a new machine, like for, for a customer, uh, we went to the machine and we booted it from a floppy disk and said, this is machine number 45. And then everything was pre-configured in, in an installation server. And the OS2 machine would like go to that server, fetch all of the, uh, the uh, applications that were to be installed, and a reboot like eight times in the process, and after half an hour, it was completely installed. Uh, some of my one of my colleagues, he at point forgot about th this new mode of operation, worked on his machine, and then the, you know the next morning somebody had reinstalled it. So this is a this was I only thought of it as automation at the time, but this actually was a significant difference. We had gone from working with a craft, you know, working with a thing that was in front of us, to working with a process the process of installing machines. And if you look at uh, the rest of the IT world, this is a trend that we see. We, we move from traditional infrastructure to infrastructure described as code, from traditional ops to DevOps, and from, from doing quality assurance on a piece of uh, sort of the, a new release that we're going to bless because it is good enough to continuously doing this and working with improving the quality process with CICD. And likewise with, app, with installing applications versus building containers uh, from scratch all the time. And data ops and data factories essentially is essentially taking this principle of 
going from a craft to a process, uh, but with data. We're, we're so used since way back to our, our database-centric systems, which essentially is the database is a pet that we cuddle. And we write, care, write careful code so as not to destroy the structures. Whereas the big data revolution essentially brought a new way of thinking where we store the raw data and then we have pipelines refining that data. And we no longer uh, work with the data itself directly. We work with the process of creating valuable artifacts in our pipelines. And the book that has inspired me most in my career is, is the Toyota Way, uh, which sort of explained the principles of Lean to me. And there are lots of relevant principles that, we, that are applicable for, for data uh, engineering and working with data. But I've highlighted a few of them. It, the process I mentioned, but also eliminating waste, getting rid of, of things that shouldn't be there to make a focus on the right things. Yeah, and, I, and Lars, I came at this a, a bit of a different way growing up in the 80s in the former industrial heartland of America and seeing um, the Japanese beat in Milwaukee, the small engine manufacturers and the auto manufacturers, and they made better cars and they lasted longer. And my dad was in a, a union and he used to take a lot of crap from his union buddies for driving a Toyota car. But he said it was, and it was true, it was cheaper and it lasted longer. And so a book called The Machine That Changed the World that came out in the late 80s, or early 90s, actually drove me to this, that, you know, that there's something about the factory, something about the process in which we work that has a real effect. And, and you know, that's in a lot of ways why American Motors, which was in Kenosha, Wisconsin, went out of business and Toyota became one of the largest, uh, if not the largest auto manufacturer in the world. Yeah. And uh, as far as I understand, the, the American uh, car industry reinvented itself to some degree with the help of Toyota, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and some of the ideas came, came from Dr. Deming and it's American. But I think the idea of this sort of lean and Toyota way has become a standard way of manufacturing and as opposed to sort of Taylorism as a way to sort of, you know, think of, uh, you know, try to break each piece down. Yeah. Uh, so we're going to look at some of these principles, and uh, some of them will be recurring throughout the presentation, uh, like uh, stopping to fix problems instead of go letting letting problems uh, wait until runtime, and uh, standardizing tasks and processes. And we'll see how how these uh, during the presentation how these uh, come in in, in uh, data processing data factories. We're going to look at four different pieces or types of waste. One is the cognitive waste, the thing that steals your attention uh, instead of you, it steals time from you doing deliver, valuable work. Then there's the delivery waste, the uh, things that prevent you from, throw, from getting things out into production. And then operational waste, the things that steal your time once things are in production. And then last, uh, product waste, which is things that, uh, things you do that do not actually uh, help create product value or end user value. So looking first at cognitive waste, uh, if you've been in a large scale and data lake environment, you've probably seen a lot of this. I was in one company, which is very mature, very skilled. Uh, and I think I counted to like 25 different ways to, to write down time. And some of them were, were like really weird. Uh, and they were hard to get rid of because of, of fear of changing things, which we will look at later. Uh, but this happens, this type of cognitive waste is not only in the, in the uh, format of things, but also in the, in the naming of things and definition of, of uh, common things like orders or users or transactions and so forth. And also, if you have to ask yourself, where's the truth for this type of data? Is it in the database? Is it in the lake? Or is it in the stream somewhere? then that adds to your cognitive waste. Yeah, and plus we're building just really complicated distributed systems that have lots of data and lots of tools. And just to understand the complexity of the, the server infrastructure and then the process view is, um, is, is quite complicated. And so I think data and analytics is not just about you know, one process running on one machine with one user. It's a, it's a team sport across a distributed system. Yeah. 
completely agree. And it's this team sport that makes it difficult, right? If there was only one person, things everything would be coherent. <laughs> Well, no, maybe that's the way you write code, but not I, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> so wh where does this cognitive waste come from? Well, one one thing uh, which uh, Chris mentioned is this: the uh, we have a number of teams that are, that are collaborating. And if we have a culture where you don't have to ask for permission to, to and have to uh, synchronize everything with everyone, then we can choose freely. And in that choice, uh, although it enables us it has the uh, the side effect of creating uh, diversity, cre uh, harmful the harmful type of diversity, uh, and creating heterogeneity. And also, if you if you favor throwing things out right now rather than uh, going coming to a consensus on, on what the semantics should be and so forth. And in most of the companies where I worked, these throwing things out right now have been much higher rewarded than trying to ensure that things are homogeneous, coordinated, and that we don't have waste. So, yeah, so there's, there's the opposite, right. Lars, where you've got rigid companies who are trying to not have, uh, um, you know, they're, they're trying to make change hard in order to reduce the risk of error. And so in some ways, there this idea of, of lean or, or data ops is the happy medium, right, between potential chaos by having autonomy and freedom and the boot on your neck of, of control. And how do you mix and, and last between those two? Yeah, and the being rigid and making it hard to change things, making it is making it difficult to address uh, the waste. Uh, so in, in order to, and avoid waste, what, what, what can you do in order to not get it in, in from the beginning? Well, reuse, of course, if someone else has defined the way to store time or define semantics and so forth. Uh, it should, if it's easy to reuse that definition, then, then uh, you will have less waste. But in order for things to be easy to reuse, you must be able to find them and find the documentation about them and also be able to change them. Uh, be able to change them so that they fit your needs. So if you have a read-only sharing, that's that's not sufficient. You need to have write capacity. And in order to have write capacity, it needs to be easy to change things. Uh, which brings us to how to eliminate waste. Uh, if, if you already have the cognitive waste, then the way to eliminate it is to harmonize things. Right? But if you're scared about harmonizing things, changing the time form and so forth, then uh, obviously you will never take the effort to make that uh, change to harmonize things. And the, you remember the, the pipeline, the, the redundant parallel pipeline that I mentioned a couple of slides earlier. When we finally, years later, were about to remove that pipeline, it turned out that it took us a year and a half to, to remove that pipeline and replace it with something new uh, because we didn't know what it would break downstream. It was a high risk of removing things yeah and i think that's also a, a bit of cognitive waste on teams because um a, a lot of teams get sort of locked in fear of change because uh, data and analytic teams have to um, deal with their customers complaining very upfront about if it's wrong or if it's late or if it's incorrect and we build these sort of very crystalline uh, sets of code that we don't want to change, we don't want to we don't want to touch once it's working, and so it is very true. You create a pipeline and it can live forever, and so partly the reason it's crystalline, I think, has to do with testing, and partly I think it has to do with what Lars said is that we we're in a complexity business, and how do you tame complexity? Well, there's ideas that came from software engineering about encapsulation and reuse and sharing, and partly. Um, as a data scientist, you think you do think your job is to get insight to your customer. But the way that you get insight is to build a system that delivers insight. And in order to build a good system, you've got to deal with the complexity of that system. And the and the complexity is is everyone's cre creating. And when you start off as a software engineer, you get hit up in the head with um, uh, the complexity of the system. And I think this is coming back to bite us in data science and engineering because we're building very complicated 
you know, 10,000, 100,000 line of code systems across multiple tools and teams, and, and we need to handle it. And they should be distributed and super scalable and fault resilient and everything, and things grow complex. Um, so coming on to a different type of waste, um, the friction to get things out the door, uh, to get from your the idea that you have in your head to uh, to writing code and getting it out to production. And in, in an ideal world, there will be an idea, some research, on figure, learning things, and then writing code, and then in pr production, and, and then repeat the learning code in production and so forth. Anything else that you do is friction and waste. Now we do tend to do lots of things here that, that are uh, waste. There's also in the in the lean world, there is something called inventor, one form of waste, which is things that you have done but have not yet reached out to end users and have had effect. And in, in data processing, we have both code inventory, like code that, that is not yet in production, as well as data inventory, uh, da data that has not yet been fully processed. So zooming in on things here, we must remember that in for data-driven products, we cannot, if we assess quality in order to put it in production, we cannot just look at the code. We need to look at both the code and the data. So no matter how much we polish the code, the uh, we don't know the quality until it reaches real production data. Therefore, we have to test things in production and throw things out and get feedback right away from pr real production data. And the, perhaps the best illustrative example here is when Apple launched Apple Maps. I mean, Apple are super good at polishing things to perfection so that the code is absolutely perfect. But when the product, who's heavily dependent on data, actually hit the real world, it turned out that the data quality was not good enough. And this was an, caused some interesting headlines. Some yeah, people. and I think that, that sense that you're building a product that is consumable by an end customer. And you may be the ETL engineer or the data scientist on it. And yeah, you may be part of it, but your end goal is to deliver value to a customer. And that value comes from the code, the data, the infrastructure it runs on. And that's your goal. Your goal isn't to just fulfill the fact that you've got a set of requirements from a Jira ticket and then you're done. And so owning the result and owning the fact that your customer's success and seeing what you do as a product, as opposed to you're just part of this, you know, overall process that you've got to do step by step because these are this is the way your organization gets done. And it's harder for people, I think, to take that customer first product, I own the result work, but it's actually a much more satisfying way to work. I completely agree. The uh, it, I, I'm a very holistic person. I, I prefer the you know work, working with products end to end, and it's much more rewarding. So if you look at uh, how to eliminate uh, delivery waste, it in in theory it's simple. Just question everything that you do. But this is actually more difficult in practice than it sounds because you will be uh, you will be hindered by the assumptions that you make of what is necessary and what is not necessary. And I'd like to highlight this book and the State of DevOps report because they can, they throw away some of the myths or dispel some of the myths, in particular the most important myth that there is some kind of trade-off between speed and reliability and quality. It turns out that the, that the teams with the highest reliability and quality products in the end, they're also the teams that move the fastest. So code inventory, which is code that we have not yet fully utilized. And uh, this is prevalent in many computer systems. In, it is particularly prevalent in, in data processing where, where code lies in notebooks or in experimental uh, pipelines that never make it out to production and so forth uh, for ages. And uh, it's mostly common that a problem is not specific to data. And uh, likewise, a, a great resource 
providing this type of waste here is, is the site trunk-based development, which actually has scope much more than, than trunk-based, but it gives you a, it makes you think about what you need and what you don't actually really need. So I mentioned data inventory, and this is also something that we have taken for granted for so long that there has to be invent inventory in unprocessed data because in the database centric world, we have this idea that we put the, the data in our databases in a normalized manner. And then at runtime, when the user requested some data, uh, we did the processing and join the data uh, so that we presented a, a list of the user's orders or whatever he was requesting. It turns out that if there's a problem in that join or that processing, we will notice at runtime and we will have a, a, a bad user experience or an outage. So in, when we're shifting to working with data pipelines and data factories, we do eager processing instead. We strive to process the data in advance and denormalize it so it's prepared for the user. And if something goes wrong in that processing, the data pipeline will crash, but that's fine uh, because we, we know how to make the impact of that crash uh, low, which we'll come to later. And so this is the equivalent of what is in Lean, is called an Andon core. In, in, in manufacturing pipelines, they have a core that they pull whenever something goes wrong. And then they stop the pipeline and figure out the problem and solve the problem because before the pipeline continues. Yeah, and, and in most organizations, they have a, a huge amount of data that they have yet to analyze. And so, um, you know, there's a sense of humbleness here that you don't know what your customer wants. And if you can get something into your customer's hands first, you can learn what they want. And one of the biggest wastes uh, beyond the ones that Lars have said is the fact that people spend months doing the wrong thing and they build something that is not useful to a customer. And the most important way to make sure that you have something that is useful to the customer is to get and push feedback as early and often in the process. And so uh, that way, when you're building a, a model or a data set or a visualization, having customer feedback keeps you from wandering off in the wrong direction for months. And believe me, I've done it. And it's no fun to spend months. I mean, perhaps it's fun that you get to go and live in your right code by yourself or with the one or two people. But the reality is it's uh, you, you would rather much rather have something done and useful to your customer and getting feedback on that. And you know, there's a lot of companies have a lot of data and they assume that if I build a bunch of data and put it all together, um, people will come. It's as if I've gotten all my data together. It's the, what we call the field of dreams. You know, you build it and they will come. And so uh, just the fact that you have a lot of data inventory doesn't mean it's useful. You're trying to find the useful data and the way to make it useful in an iterative uh, development methodology combined with lean principles is the way to go. Which touches on one of the other lean principles, you know, uh, pull workload rather than push. I mean, we've we, I've seen many examples where your, your data is just poured into a lake in the hope that something good will happen later. Whereas the, uh, there is a lean principle that you should uh, only pull the data and do the work that's actually needed for a, for a use case. Taking us to the third type of ways, the operational ways, the, the things that take your steal your time and, and cause you harm when things are in production. So uh, it comes in a couple of, of variants. One is friction when you are, want to do operational maneuvers, when you want to deploy something, you want to, to uh, change a pipeline or, or upgrade and so forth. And that friction is very often caused by fear, fear of breaking things, fear of doing the wrong thing which ties to the costs of things going wrong, right? If, if, if the th things go wrong are very costly, then you need to be afraid or people become afraid to, to change things. So let's look at how we can cut down the cost of incidents. <clears throat> the key uh, principle here is to separate online environments from offline environments. In the online world, you have your production database that serve users. If they go wrong, if something happened here, uh, you, you will have very many unhappy customers. Uh, whereas much of the data processing can be done in the offline world. So you take your data out, take copies and dump, dump your databases, collect events and so forth, 
to do the processing offline when nobody's hurt if things go wrong. And when you have finally made an artifact of value, like a new fraud model that you want to uh, throw out into the online world, you say, oh, you, you sort of move it very carefully to the online world without disrupting production. And then you ha have a principle of, of, you apply principle of having multiple older copies of that same fraud model. So if something goes wrong in the offline world and you'll have an outage for hours or a day, you still have some old copies around it that you can use. So the careful handovers between the offline and the online world. And then you can lower the cost of incidents. You have low cost of incidents in the offline world, which means that you can move much, much faster. So let's let's zoom in a little on on how uh, different how there can be differences in costs between the uh, online and offline world and also between data traditional data uh, traditional architectures and and data factories. So in this case we have we have a typical microservice architecture. Let's say one of your uh, one of your services goes wrong and it spits out invalid data now. You don't know, it's hard to figure out where that data has, has gone. If you discover the problem like two days later, who has asked for this data? Where, who ha where has it propagated from the source of the error to out to the different uh, services? You have a, if this is important data, you have a very painful operational procedure ahead of you in order to, to um, recover from there. Whereas if you switch here to do to apply functional pro, uh, principles instead of the object-oriented microservices, you apply functional principles and do stream processing. So you regard all of the events in the streams as immutable. You don't touch them. You just transform them to new streams. Then you, it's easier to reason which data is now corrupt because it's all everything downstream from a particular point in time. So this cuts down the operational overhead in case you have uh, software bugs. You can cut it down even more by not having unbounded streams of, of millions of events per day and instead uh, lump them into boxes, batches, and you say, OK, here's today's event and here are tomorrow's events and so forth. And then when something goes wrong, you have uh, not 3 million events that, that were bad. You have three boxes of uh, three batches of events. And you can say, hey, these three days, the batches were wrong. Sorry, can you please recover from there? And that takes things to human time scale, it makes it much easier to uh, to efficiently operate. Yeah, and I think a, a lot of organizations have inherited this idea of a data warehouse, which is this, it, it's built on more of a non-functional or an, a stateful architecture where you're constantly appending things and it's not, uh, it's like a object in software where you can't reason about its internal state. And just like functional programming in, in software, I think functional principles apply to data operations where you can, if you can always start with an immutable data, you can always start with your base data and get to where you are again by a process and a series of steps. Um, it becomes easier, as Lars says, to reason about your system. It becomes easier to run parallel versions of your system. And it, it's not any more expensive because we live in a cloud world where having where disk and, and CPU are cheap. And so functional architectures where you can go, you can always go back to the base data, the immutable data and start over again, are another e easier way to handle the complexity of these systems when stuff goes wrong. Um, and in fact, they're probably easier to, to build with the, from the beginning. And so these design patterns of, of how you think about these complicated multi-team, multi-CPU, multi-processing engine types, I think are actually very important in how people design things. And I think the, the pattern that was taught through the, the 90s and 2010s of building a data warehouse and patching it, patching it, patching it every day until you're right, I think actually makes things more complicated and harder to change. So the operational cost here of the of the traditional object oriented online systems is is usually a hidden waste. And one of my pet peeves is that there's uh, way too much trend towards online and near line and fast and stream processing that disregards the operational cost. Uh, so I tend tend to tell all my clients to to think about their use case. Can you live with a few minutes latency? Then batch will save you operational time that you can use for data innovation instead. It's all about eliminating waste. 
Which takes us to the last form of waste, the product waste, where you do work that's not actually driven by a need from a user customer and so forth. Uh, or where you have uh, value in your data that you cannot release due to some kind of friction and so forth. And this unrealized value uh, is, I usually uh, talk about demo data democratization the, uh, as a solution here, the, the importance of making your data accessible and well formatted and so forth. And, and I cut in a bit, a uh, small little quote here from Adam Kinney, my uh, ex-manager now at Mixed Panel. Uh, that tends to yield, making the data accessible, valuable, and usable, it tends to yield much more value than all of the shiny and fancy things in, in, in my experience. And with that, I leave the uh, token to Christopher for the rest of the presentation. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Lars. So I'm gonna, uh, hopefully you can see my screen. So, um, you know, one of the biggest, if you can see my screen and I'm presenting this sort of bar graph, you know, one of the biggest things is that people are not spending time on doing the cool stuff that they want to do, new features and data sets for customers. They're spending a lot of time in a reactive mode, reacting to errors, reacting to the complexity of the organization. Um, and some of that complexity comes from the fact that data in analytics itself is not owned by one team. Uh, the rise of self-service tools like Tableau and Trifacta have made the collaboration part between a central team and a decentralized team very, um, very complicated. And so we've got these complex roles and complex organizations, complex tool chains and data and collaboration. And as a result, we're not spending enough time doing the things that really matter to add value to the data products that we deliver to our customers. And so in a lot of ways, I, you know, I brought up at the beginning the 1970s car industry. And, and I think it's uh, I think that's the case where, you know, our ability to put something in, into production in the cycle time at which we could do new models and change of cars is very, very slow weeks or months. And the amount of errors that we have in production, not just from poor data quality, but from processing errors or timeliness errors is huge. And actually, it's really untracked. Um, and I find a lot of data and analytics teams start with promise and they end up being very frustrated because um, and we found a lot of CDOs have a chief data officers have a short tenure. People are leaving the data and analytics pro profession, which is unfortunate because they're frustrated. And so, um, you know, and I've got a bunch of gray hair because for many years I ran data and analytics teams and I suffered under the the fact that if you had a, a data error and Lars and Lars and I were talking about our big data errors and, you know, my thousands of sales reps all yelling at me because something was wrong. And um, that can really, you know, it can really uh, cause you to uh, have a very painful life. And so um, if we look at this, one source of pain is the fact that these pipelines themselves um, follow what's called Conway's law. And that means that they're designed based on the way the organization is structured. And in a lot of organizations, a customer is at one point and there may be a self-service team using tools like Tableau or Alteryx. There may be a data science team. There may be a back end data pipeline team. And all three of these teams may or may not work for the same boss and they may or may not sit in the same building or they may or they may work and have completely different organization structures. And what Conway realized is that how you engineer something is actually reflective of that organization structure. And if you were, uh, you know, as, as I am a software engineer, you'd realize that that's probably not a, a great way to, um, may not be the best and optimal way to organize your your team. And so let's look at how that looks in some organizations. And this is a bit of an eye chart, but let me let me let me talk to you. And if we go to the left, the left column that says centralized development, and the D is a, a development team, and it contains a data engineer, a data scientist, and someone doing BI and maybe governance, and they're all a team. And the question then becomes if they all work for the same boss, well, how does the data engineer who does the data work coordinate with the data scientist who does the model and the person who does the visualization? You know, how do, how do they work together on the same team? But normally that team also does their work and then hands it off to a production team. So they deploy to production and someone else monitors that production analytics for errors. And so you've got this collaboration in the second column between development teams and production. And if we go to the third column in this, 
a lot of organizations have decentralized development. Maybe they have a one team that does a data warehouse. And then in one line of business, they have a team that does analytics with Tableau. Another team has Click uh, in a different part of the organization. A third team has, has Cognos. And so you have this decentralized development model. And on top of that, those teams themselves may push to production to a separate team. And so you have this mesh or network of um, centralized production and, and, and centralized development and decentralized production and decentralized development. And so how do we collaborate between this? And the column on the right is actually, I think, the state of most large companies today, where um, this sort of collaboration complexity starts to override everyone and makes it very, very hard to, for customers to understand, well, something's wrong, who do I call? Well, do I call the production team who works in the line of business? Do I call the centralized production team? And even just finding a data error, it can take a full day to figure out which part of the pie it came from, who owns it, and then for them to diagnose it. And that's just too short for the speed of business, and it has too many people involved. I think so I think as a result, Oh, yeah. I, I think this got worse as we, we move to data driven products because it used to be the case that we were developing and, and then threw over the wall to operations that put it in production and then sort of develop DevOps sort of addressed that. But now we have data scientists that sit in the corner with, with, with a pile of static data. They build a model in Python and they threw it over the wall to the developers who rewrite it in Java and, and uh, then they when they put it on, on fresh data, it behaves differently, and then they throw it over the wall to the to the operations and so forth. So we have an even worse situation. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's almost like dev and ops was a nice one-to-one -one problem, but data ops is sort of a many-to-many -many problem where you have many developers and many production and they've all got to work together. Um, and even uh, these teams who are normally building software, like if you're building a website for your company, well, what if you're going to put a new attribute on a table in that in the, for that website? How does that attribute on that table actually show up in a data warehouse and, 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 and in a model and in a visualization of that? And coordinating the deployment from when you've got a DevOps team building software and when you've got a data team following data ops, that's also another point of collaboration here. And, and uh, all these things, I think, are contentions. I mean, there's been plenty of times, and I think everyone who's done data for a career has been surprised when their data feed changes all of a sudden and they didn't know. Um, columns are added, drops are added. And so collaborating between your data providers is, is even another case. And so this many-to-many -many problem, this uh, disjoint, discombobulated value chain, I think, is inherent in data and analytics and in a way that's much more painful than in, than in software development. Um, and, and so I think, at least my experience, is that a lot of data teams are suffering because they're caught between data providers who don't care about them, data customers who think they should get everything the next day, and this collaboration problem between teams. And so I run into a lot of teams who are kind of actually beaten down and distraught and feeling disempowered and they can't create and innovate. And you know, I felt that way when I ran a data team starting in 2005 to about, uh, to, in the 2005 to about 2010, I was, why is this, why does my life suck so much? Why do I hate to come into work and find there's a problem or I can't seem to go fast enough or if I go fast, I break things and how do I let people try out new tools? And so, um, having lived that life for a year, for years and, and suffering from it, I think there's a better way. And I think the ideas in Lean, the ideas in Data Ops are a way for people um, to reclaim control and not be sort of beaten down by this. And, and um, because just buying another tool or applying a new algorithm isn't going to save you. You need to really fundamentally rethink your process. And that's similar to car makers in the U.S., you know, at a big time in the 80s, they were all thinking about doing industrial robots would save them. And, and it didn't. Uh, it's all about the system and the process that you work in. And so, um, you know, I define uh, data ops as kind of a set of technical practices and cultural norms and architecture patterns that really enable this rapid cycle of innovation to get feedback from your customer that allow you to produce analytics and data sets at a very, very low error rate. So you don't have a lot of problems. 
and then um, allow you to collaborate across complex sets of people and technology and environments. So if you think about these three things, you could almost see they're all opposite. I want to go fast. I want to not break things. I don't want to get everybody in the organization who touches the data value chain involved. Most people would think that that's laughable, right? And so if you look at the lessons from Accelerate that um, in, in software, they were able to bring cycle time and error rates high up. And I think in data ops, we're seeing that you can bring cycle times and error rates and collaboration high up. And all those things can happen together. It takes some work, but it also takes a different perspective that comes in from Lean. And so, um, you know, what we've seen for people who adopt these ideas in, in data ops, and we wrote a manifesto and a book on it, um, is that the time that they spent doing this crappy errors and operational tasks go down. So they end up having both time to do cool new things, but also because you're a believer in iterative development, you have a time to go fast and, and you need to do um, process improvement and technical debt, as Lars talked about, being able to change things and refactor and improve because you know, you're, you're dealing with a complex distributed system and lots of code and lots of people. And, you know, if you apply these ideas, then you can start getting your deployment latency tap down. You can start minimizing the time that it takes from the ideas in your head as a data scientist or a data engineer until you get it in a product that your customer can react to. And you can do it in a way that's low errors and your team can be happier and I think more efficient. And so I think all these benefits are there from data ops. And so um, let's talk about one last thing before I finish up. And, and there's been a lot of talk about DevOps and data ops and all these ops as words out there. And like, what do they mean? There's AI ops and ML ops and model ops and data sec ops. And so I just wanted to like clear it up. So I think basically there's a biz, basically I think whether you run a manufacturing line or build software or do data and analytics, there's a common set of business management concepts that come from lean or learning organizations or Deming. And it's really focused on error rates and cycle time and flow and collaboration and measurement. They're all kind of the same concepts at, at a high level because you know, there's a shared technical thing that this team is helping run or build of assembly line software analytics. And so if you look at it, how that team is organized, how the people talk to each other, there's different methods. And there's team management methods like Agile and Kanban and Scrum. Um, there's lots of the, you know, different ways. And then in, in manufacturing, there's Six Sigma and total quality management. There's books out there. And you can go to any library and find 50 books on each one of these things on how you should manage teams and, and the people. But that, And that's fine. But I also think in a lot of what we're talking about is more um, what people do you align this to? And we've been speaking today, particularly in the middle column, the data science, engineering, and analytic teams, and not so much about industrial teams or, or software teams. And if you look at it from a technical environment, how do you actually do this? For IT teams, there's a well-developed thing about DevOps or DevSecOps, GitOps or AIOps, and all these terms that really apply to IT and software teams and how, how to have them go fast, how to, how to be a learning organization. Um, and I think the ideas of data ops and some people call it model ops or ML ops are the same, except they're just the same ideas applied to data science, engineering and analytic teams. And so um, and I think this technical environment is essential. You can't just do quick iterative development without building the factory that enables you to do it. And so you can't. Uh, it will focus on customers and focus on products important, but we're talking about the system, the process, the factory that makes it work. And so to conclude uh, my talk, I just want to have two thoughts. Uh, one is that uh, th th they're all related around this idea that what you do is much less important than how you do it. So what you do, the model, the um, schema, the visualization is much less important than the system that you work in. And so here's a quote from Elon Musk. He said, we realize that the true problem, the true difficulty and where the greatest potential is, is in building the machine that makes the machine, the factory. And so another case and uh, Dr. Deming, and many of you have problems and errors and 94% of the causes were in the system, not in the person. And so instead of blaming your team members for the problem, build a system, build a factory around it. And that, in fact, I think, the most talented people in the organization should be working on this factory. So 
uh, because I think the factory of insight, the lean principles can actually accelerate the way that you do work, make it much more enjoyable and give more value to your customers. And so that's the purpose of our talk is there's something beyond what you're currently doing in data science and engineering that's actually really important. And think about the system and the process around it and you'll be, uh, you'll be successful. So that's it in terms of my, our presentation. I think we uh, targeted Lars. Is that right that we targeted 45 minutes? Yeah, that seems to be all right. Uh, um, I, I'm back on. Um, I would like to thank you, Lars and, and Christopher, for the great presentation and also for this uh, kind of format to uh, combine a talk and giving it more like a conversational style. I liked it very much. Thank you for that. And I think we have a, just time for just one more question be, before we have to uh, leave uh, into the breakout room. Uh, we can ask a few more questions. So I will check the Slack once more. And there's a, fresh, a question from uh, Christoph, um, who's asking, uh, considering lean and agile principles, shouldn't we strive for cross-functional autom autonomous uh, teams with devs and data people focusing on solving customer needs incrementally. Let me uh, read the question here. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, perhaps it wasn't clear, but th that's one of the uh, solutions to, uh, to make sure that the work that you do results in product value. Right? I've, I've been in, in organizations where we would uh, you know, there was a data collection team who handed the data over to a cleaning team who handed the data over to a user modeling team who handed the data over to the, like, the recommendations team. And there was tons of waste because they were, we were doing this, the wrong thing. So, so in successful organizations, I've seen teams that are, are cross-functional, as you say, have all the skills necessary to do the cleaning and do, do all of the things that take you from, from raw data essentially to to end user value. Uh, and that, that might very well include things like UX uh, and so forth. So, so as close as possible to, to align with the use case. Uh, but if you have, if, if you just let the, the autonomy loose, then you will get too much cognitive waste in the end. So you have to counterbalance it with something, right? Uh, uh, so that, so there's, a, there's a balance here. Yeah, and I also think the, um, you know, autonomous teams are great, but it's also, it's also about really getting the teams to emotionally understand and own the result, because sometimes it's easier to have a little bit of cognitive distance and say, oh, I'm, you know, I'm just doing, even with Agile, I can say, well, I'm doing Agile and I'm on a cross-functional team. I don't really care if my customer is getting value from this. I don't really care if they're using it. So I think the care in which you feel that it, it, it's important that your customer gets value from it. Um, and actually uses it, I think is really important. And honestly, that, that's hard sometimes. It's hard to hear negative feedback that I didn't find, you know, you spent a week or a month on something and your customer looks at it and goes, ah, that's not what I wanted. And it's hard, but it's actually part of, you know, the sort of loving failure and having a safety culture where you can fail and fail forward and learn from failure, I think is, a, is, is, a, is also an important part of how you run the team. Okay, thank you. So uh, time is uh, up. I think we uh, need to uh, switch to the breakout room, which is advertised in the uh, uh, um, screen below. So it's berlinbuzzwords.de slash vbus2. And we can continue the uh, conversation on uh, the great talk by uh, Lars and Christopher. And I would like to... Uh, um, Thank you once more for your presentation. And uh, just will announce that in t just about 20 minutes, the sessions will be continuing. So All right, I'll be in the right end room.